Well, let's get to the lesson then this morning. And we're going to be talking about the psalm. I, the title I give the sixth psalm is the psalm of the sin sick soul. Turn in your Bibles to Psalm 6, the sixth psalm. And we'll see what we can learn from this psalm. First, let's read the psalm together. This psalm has an inscription to the chief musician upon the Gynoth, upon Sheminoth, a psalm of David. I want you to notice it's a psalm of David. A lot of these psalms sound very personal, and this one does as well. But I want you to notice in the inscription, David wrote this for the chief musician. So whatever David was writing about personally, the Holy Spirit wants David, he wants this before all of us. This became a, a personal psalm of David that becomes public for all, to bless all who read that. And it'll bless us today as we look at it as well. That word Nagainoth, we came across that in the fourth psalm, and I won't go into that again, but it's a word that well, we're not sure what it means, but the, the most common suggestion is it's talking about stringed instruments. Now, we don't use instruments in our worship because that was associated with the old covenant and the new covenant we don't. But in your mind, I want you to hear the psalm begin with a string instrument. Now, we'll use a pitch pipe sometime to get, a, to get the note. I want you to hear one chord from that string instrument in your mind to set the mood for this psalm. That next word that is also untranslated upon Shemineth. Well, if they knew what it meant, they would have translated it. So again, they're guessing here a little bit. But the commentators say that it might mean upon the eighth. Now, what does that mean? Well, these are musical arrangements. I want you to, in your mind, imagine, before we get into this psalm, one chord from a stringed instrument. Let it be a low minor chord, which could have been what the eighth was, because that would set the mood for this psalm. The sixth psalm is the first of what is called the penitential psalms. They're psalms of sorrow. It's a psalm of sorrow for sin. Now sickness is associated with this, as we'll see. But I want you to capture that mood. And that inscription then might be there to help us understand the mood for what, what we're going to get into when we look at this psalm. Now let's read the psalm, and then we'll <coughs> go through and see what we learn from it. O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. My soul is also sore, vexed. But thou, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, deliver my soul. O save me for thy mercy's sake. For in death there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave who shall give thee thanks? I'm weary with my groaning. All the night I make my bed to swim. I'll water my couch with my tears. Mine eye is consumed because of grief. It waxeth old because of all mine enemies. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. For the Lord hath heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord hath heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. Let all mine enemies be ashamed and sore vexed. Let them return and be ashamed suddenly. Now let's look at this psalm. He starts off with a pitiful plea. O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. 
Now we're reading the book of Hebrews, the Lord chastens those he loves like a parent would chasten a child because he wants us to do better than that. And so he teaches us this way. And I'm sure as we were growing up, we were all chastened at times. But David doesn't want the Lord to chasten him in his anger. Certainly one of the most fearsome thoughts to imagine is a God that God being angry with you and showing forth his displeasure in his chastening. Now, I'm like every parent in here, you've had to chasten your children. And a lot of times they make you mad. And that's the same time you need to chasten them. They make you angry and they make you angry because they've done something wrong and you've got to chasten them. And you've got to be very careful, don't you? When you chasten children while you're angry. I tell you, if you're so angry, you can't use judgment in your chastening, you better let it go. You could hurt that child. Now, they will make you angry, but you're the grown up. So you control your anger and you teach your children in the way that you discipline them. I bet David knew about that too. He did not want God. The chastening of the Lord is bad enough, but for God to chasten in anger. So David is making this plea. Now, why would God be angry at David? I think David, you're going to see in this song, he's got a guilty conscience. Now, he is suffering. But one of the things he's suffering from is not just sickness. He's suffering from guilt. And so he doesn't want the Lord angry with him. A passage to remember here is in Jeremiah 10, 24, where the prophet said, O oh Lord, correct me, but with judgment. Not in thine anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. And so this is how this psalm begins. Now David is sick. Now you know how it is to be sick. David has a prolonged sickness. And look how terribly sick David has become. I am weak, O oh Lord, heal me. For my bones are vexed. I mean, it's one thing to be sick, but to be sick to the bone. Now that is really getting sick, isn't it? My bones are vexed. And then my soul is also sore vexed. This has to do with, with David's spiritual sickness. This is part of his guilty conscience. He says, but thou, O oh Lord, how long? It's very common for the translators to fill in in italics the missing thoughts and sentences like this. And so when you're looking at the italics, if you've got the King James Version, you'll see the italics. That's not really in the text. That's what the translators are trying to fill in the gaps. And I'm glad they didn't put any italics here. As you read this, you almost want to take a breath after each little phrase. But thou, O Lord, how long? As David's having trouble, maybe not getting his breath, but certainly getting his thoughts together completely. And it expresses the, the agony under which David is under. Evidently, this sickness has been a prolonged sickness. And he wants relief. And he hardly even knows how to ask for it. And so with these incomplete thoughts expressed in that, we see what, what's going on in David's mind and in David's heart. Now he says, I am weary with my groaning. David groaning in sickness, but David is also grieved. Look at this. All night... All the night I make my bed to swim. I water my couch with my tears. Mine eye is consumed because of grief. It's as though he's crying his eyes out so much that look, they just, they're just going to dry up on him. And so that shows the grief he is under. David is sick. He is bad sick. And he is prolonged in his sickness. And he is grieving and he's afraid because he's got a guilty conscience. And this is not a good situation for David to be in. Now, he says something here that, uh, that well, well, 
before we go that, look at this. Sickness. We've got members here that are sick, don't we? And some of them are very bad sick. And some of them it's been going on a long time. Now all sickness is not caused by our sin. Let's remember that. Sometimes you get sick and you maybe start thinking awful thoughts, but every sickness is not a direct result of our sin. And so consider Job. Look what Job said. Satan, that is, he went forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot to his crown. In Job 7, 4 through 5, Job said, I'm full of tossing to and fro until the dawning of the day. My flesh is clothed with worms and clods of dust. My skin is broken and become loathsome. And his breath was bad. My breath is corrupt. And Job 19, 20, my bone cleaveth to my skin and to my flesh. Job is physically miserable. But we know from Job's account, it's not because Job had done wrong. So every time we're suffering with sickness, it's not necessarily because we've sinned. But sometimes some sins can make you sick. Substance abuse can make you sick. Proverbs 23, 29 through 32. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine and that go to seek mixed wine, look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Alcohol is one of those substances that can make you sick. And there's many other kind of drugs and substances that can leave people just sick. And so their sin made them sick, didn't it? And fornication can make you sick. Sexual immorality can lead to death, physical death, because of the diseases associated with that. And David, uh, uh, Paul says, 1 Corinthians 6, 18, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. And he alludes to this in the book of Romans. Romans 1, 26 through 27. God gave them up to vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature, and likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. Sometimes that recompense is a sickness. Now there's other sins that can leave you sick. And not just physically, but mentally and emotionally. You remember Adam in the garden? After he sinned, remember what he said? I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Fear and shame. That's what sin will do to you. I tell you, that affects who you are. And so sin can leave you with fear and shame. Sin can make you sick. And it may not always be directly obvious, but sin's always a spiritual sickness, isn't it? Think of sin as a spiritual sickness. Now look at this expression. Don't misunderstand this one. David says, in death there's no remembrance of thee. In the grave who shall give thee thanks? Go out to the cemetery. And those stones are mighty quiet, aren't they? But that's not the only thing out there quiet. Those who are buried under the ground, under those stones, they're quiet too. You won't hear them. Their laughter is gone and their groanings are gone. And they're quiet. Now we know 
from the rest of what the Bible teaches that there is life beyond this grave. And you take that rich man that went to torment. I tell you, he was still suffering and suffering more than in life. And, then, and we've read in the book of Revelation, there's also glory and honor and praise given to God. So don't take an expression like this and, and apply it beyond what it means. It's talking about insofar as this life is concerned. There's, there's praise and honor and glory we can give to God in this life. And then when this life is over, there's things beyond the grave that, that just not going to change. Now's the time to make the change. Because you can't change it after the grave. Now the fate is sealed. And as far as this life is concerned, then there's no more remembrance and no more giving of thanks. You had that chance to do that. And this body will lie quietly while that soul has returned unto God to, to whatever God has in store for us beyond eternity. Now, David knows where to turn. I've heard people say, oh Lord, in ways that I wish they just hadn't say it. I mean, they just say it, it's almost, I don't think they're really cursing, and I, sometimes I don't think they're thinking, but we've got to be careful how we use the Lord's name, don't we? You've heard it. People just say, well, oh Lord, about, about just the most trivial things. And we need to really clean up our language and, and erase vocabulary like that out of it. But, but I have also seen people in misery and they're thinking of the Lord and they'll repeat it, oh Lord, oh Lord, oh Lord, oh Lord, oh Lord. Now that's different. And that's what David's doing in this psalm. He's miserable, but he knows where to turn, doesn't he? And five times in this psalm he says, oh Lord, oh Lord, oh Lord. Oh Lord, oh Lord, in this psalm. And look what he asked for the Lord to do. Have mercy upon me. Starts off, I should have said that. Rebuke me not. Have mercy upon me. Heal me. Return. Deliver my soul. And save me. I tell you why the Holy Spirit puts that in there. He's showing us through this. That's what we need to do. When sin has gotten us and we are smitten sick by sin, that's what we need to do. We need to turn to the Lord. We need to utter these kind of expressions. And, and the Lord is telling us to do that because that's what the Lord wants to do. The Lord wants to heal us. The Lord wants to relieve us. We come to him. And so that's why the psalm is here. And that's why these expressions are given. We're being taught how to pray in times of misery like this. And when we pray like that, it's appropriate. That's what we're supposed to do. And that's what God wants us to do so he can come to us. Now, look right at the last. He says, because of all mine enemies, that kind of is surprising to me as I read this psalm. I wasn't expecting that in reading the psalm through. It seems a little out of step with what the psalm is here. But I tell you what, David had enemies. And while David is in his misery because of his sin, you know what his enemies are doing? Oh, they want to see him fall. They are ready to watch David go down. And if anything, that adds to the misery, doesn't it? To think that not only you're miserable, but to think that there's others out there that are glad of it and ready to watch you go out, then that would make it even worse. And so David here in the psalm turns on his enemies. Look what he says. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. And then a little further down, let all mine enemies be ashamed. And they ought to be ashamed. But let them be ashamed. Let them be sore vexed. Now David sore. Let them be sore vexed. And let them return and be ashamed suddenly. How long, he had said earlier. Well, let them be ashamed suddenly, those enemies. Now, I've got a little book in my library, and we've got one in our library. I meant to pull it out here. The title of the book is None of These Diseases. It's, if you haven't ever read that book, it's, it's one, I think it'll fascinate you. 
It comes from this passage out of Exodus 15, 26. If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear this commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee which I brought upon the Egyptians. He's telling Israel, <laughs> I'm going to give you a law to live by. Over in Egypt, those folks are sick. I, they must have been horrible sicknesses in Egypt people were suffering from, and a lot of that was because of the way they were living. And some of this is because they just didn't have, they didn't know about germs and diseases and, and how this was spread. Now you take the Israelites out and the Lord says, I'm going to tell you how to live. Now you follow that and you won't get those diseases. And then what this author did, this doctor, he went down and examined the, the laws, like, like the laws of leprosy, where you, you make sure the sick get it. They didn't know about disease, but they knew to keep the lepers out about the uh, the, uh, how to handle different things that would happen and uncleanness and, and how that what if they would live by these laws and eat this way and live this way there's just so much that now modern medical science shows us that's a very healthy way to live in that land where they were going and the Egyptians didn't know that they had and you compare that with the knowledge of the Egyptians it really is a strong book of evidences but how did Moses have such advanced medical understanding well, considering the background he came from? This wasn't from Moses. This came from God. But then the author does this. He applies teachings of the gospel and how if we'll follow the Lord and develop the mind of Christ, then we're spared from so many mental and emotional problems as well. Well, it's, it's a beautiful book, and I'd recommend that you try to get it. None of these diseases. Like I say, it's in our library. Jesus is called the great physician. Now, he's not called that in the Bible, but, but he is that in the Bible. He's the one of Psalm 103, verse 3, aware of it says, Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, and who healeth all our diseases. See how that's paralleled in that psalm? In Matthew 9, 12 through 13, Jesus sitting with sinners, they didn't think Jesus ought to do that. They were, no, he needs to keep away from sinners. And here's what Jesus said, they that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what this meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He came as the, the great physician to heal the sin-sick souls. You remember when they brought the palsied man to Jesus? Before he said, Arise and take up thy bed and walk, Jesus said, Thy sins be forgiven thee. The very way that Jesus would, would heal our physical infirmities is a sign and evidence that he heals our spiritual infirmities. He's the great physician. In the psalm, David prayed this, The Lord hath heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord hath heard my supplication." the Lord will receive my prayer. That capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D in the, in the Old Testament, in the American Standard Version, that's translated Jehovah. It goes back to the I am that God told himself to Moses. It's associated with the covenant that God had made with Israel. He's the God of their covenant. And David is under that covenant. See, David has a covenant relationship with God. And so he's got confidence in his prayer. When he's got this relation, he's got God's promises. And so he says, he's heard. He's heard my supplication. He heard my weeping. He'll receive my prayer. And that's the prayer of faith. And that's the way we can pray 
when we have a covenant relationship with God. This isn't just an alien sinner calling out of desperation. This is a man that has a relationship with God that knows I'm going to pray and God is going to hear my prayer. And that's what we can do when we have a covenant relationship with God. We pray and we know. Now he heard that. Acts 8 and verse 22, Peter said, Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. He's telling that to Simon. Simon had believed and been baptized. So David said, Simon, you, you can pray to God. 1 John 1, 9, and then 1 John 2, 1, John's writing to Christians here. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And then we read in James 5, 13 through 16, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. If any is merry, let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now, when I read that, I'll tell you what that does for me. That makes me want to be a Christian. Because I know I've been sick, and I expect I'll be sick again. And I want to know that when my life is going hard, I have a God in heaven. A capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D that I can go to, I've got a relationship with him, and he'll hear my prayer. And I don't have that kind of assurance if I'm not a Christian. And so if you're not a Christian, and you need God's help, then what you need to do is repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. You'll come out of that water free of sin. You're healed. And then you can spend the rest of your life knowing whatever happens, I may find myself in misery. I may even be guilty. But I know whatever happens, I've got a covenant God that I can go to in prayer. And he gave me this psalm to let me know I can do that and that he will hear. So I want to encourage everyone to be a Christian, and I want this psalm to be able to teach us what we as Christians are able to do. And so if you want to respond to the invitation this morning, be baptized, then, then you have that chance to do it as we stand and sing.